Should I uh, use the link and share screen? Yeah, share screen. Yeah. Warm up three minutes and uh, people can get into context. Yeah. Oh, it's not a YouTube video. Right? Yeah, it's, it's going to show. Sound. When we are children, our parents tell us not to talk about shit. This is a really serious problem. What you don't talk about, you cannot improve. A lot of people call me Mr. Toilet. I'm really proud when I hear that because it gives an identity to the work that I do. 40% of the world population still do not have access to a simple toilet. Shit is like fire. If you manage properly, the fire can cook your meal. If you don't manage it, it burns down your house. If you manage shit, it becomes a fertilizer. If you don't manage it, it kills you. About 90% of all the surface water in India are contaminated by feces. 1.5 million children under 5 a year in the world die unnecessarily. You have to have clean water, you have to have safe sanitation. A rich man staying next to a slum. The flies doesn't know a poor man from a rich man. So the rich man is probably eating the shit of the poor man. You better help them get toilets or you will eat their shit. Think about it. We are hosting the World Toilet Summit. This has been an international event every year since 2001. The people say, why should I use a toilet? It's fresh air outside. I can chit chat with my friend while I'm squatting there. Our big breakthrough will happen when we look at the poor as if they are customer. When we have to sell them products that are very beautiful and sexy. Once this becomes object of desire, if you don't have, you're not keeping up with the Jonas's. We want toilets to become a status symbol for the poor so that they feel proud to own a toilet. Just like a Louis Vuitton handbag. <laughs> <laughs> so really we are actually breaking the taboo on sanitation in the global news. World Toilet Day is 19 November every year. We have the big squad. We are protesting the plight of the 2.5 billion people that still do not have access to a toilet. The fact is, I think about Tyler every moment. Her life is only 80 years. I'm 52. If I'm going to spend 28 years consuming ostentatiously just to have a diamond watch that I can't read the time because it's too sparkling, it makes no sense. Doing social work that is creating some impact, I think it's better to die like that. I think we can see the day that everybody on planet Earth will have access to clean toilets any day, any time. <laughs>
an informal conversation on some of the key issues which confront us on this occasion. The World Toilet Day is on the 19th November, but since Jack had some other commitments, uh, he's leaving for Nigeria today. So we thought we will organize it today and have his views on some of the pressing issues about uh, the sanitation agenda globally. Jack needs no introduction in the sanitation sphere, and I will ask him to introduce himself, but from the short biography that he shared with us, uh, which says that Jack retired at the age of 40 after establishing 16 profitable companies and has worked and has been acknowledged by several international awards and recognition which includes the Schwab Fellow of the World in the World Economic Forum in 2006, Ashoka Global Fellow 2007, Times Magazine Hero of Environment 2008, Queen Elizabeth Commonwealth Points of Light Award 2018, and perhaps several others. So without ado, further ado, I would just like Jack to just give a brief introduction. Tell us about yourself and how did you get into this business of sanitation and toilets and in a way became a celebrity overnight, I would say. Although from your own website, you do say that you started recognizing uh, toilet day from 2001 till 2013 when the UN formally adopted it as a World Toilet Day. But just tell us your journey uh, from 2001, not even before that, Jack. Yes, um, <clears throat> welcome everyone. And this is uh, uh, just a few days before World Toilet Day, 19th of November. So I was a businessman uh, from 24 years old until 40 and after attaining financial independence i start to think about a purpose in life and uh, i switched from making money to uh, doing social work and became a full-time volunteer without pay for the last 25 years uh, what i have uh, why i have chosen toilets and sanitation and hygiene is because at that time in 2001, they were calling sanitation a water agenda. And even today, you will notice that all the humanitarian sector are calling sanitation a water agenda. And so why can't they say this is a sanitation agenda? Because when you say it's a water agenda, then you start talking about water and you forgot about sanitation because water is very important, very big, very glamorous. And sanitation is not a charismatic species. And so when they talk about water, people think about drinking water, agricultural water, virtual water, uh, irrigation, flood water. And they forgot to talk about sanitation. So I asked all the international NGO, why don't you say uh, sanitation? And they say, when I say water, I totally mean water and sanitation. I just don't like to say it. I say, why then do you imagine if you say men and you mean men and women and you don't like to say women, then how will women's solution be solved? You will just say all men are brothers and there's no women inside. So what, what uh, uh, they are telling me honestly is that if I say toilet, if I say poop, if I say shit, I cannot get donation. Nobody wants to donate. I cannot destroy my chances of getting funding. So I call it a water agenda. So then I thought, this is very dangerous because 2 million people are dying every day. No, no, every year out of uh, diarrhea. And uh, women have been raped because they have to go to the bush to open defecate. And the men saw naked women and got aroused. And, and, and uh, privacy and pollution of river and all these things are not attended to because it is... Uh, not a charismatic species. 
So since I do not need to fundraise, I'm just working uh, as a volunteer, then I take up the subject. But then if you go out there to talk about sanitation, uh, you need the kind of language that connects with people quickly. So I use humor. I make it, I call my organization the WTO, World Toilet Organization, sounds like World Trade Organization. And the media love it. They report very, very widely about this very small organization with very important message that we also tell them in very serious facts, right? So every year, we declare our founding day 19th of November as the World Toilet Day. And 13 years later, the UN General Assembly unanimously voted to adopt our founding day as the official UN World Toilet Day. So with that legitimacy, immediately also it coincides with Prime Minister Modi, Swatch Bharat campaign, which centers very heavily on toilet to build 111 million toilet to complete on the anniversary date of Mahatma Gandhi, who says that sanitation is even more imp important than independence. So I think that the politically, because we popularize it, legitimize it, toilets become a vote winner. And a lot of elections are won on promises of toilets. In India, we started in 2007, with President Abdul Kalam opening the World Toilet Summit hosted by Sulab International. And also we have the Crown Prince of the Netherlands join us. And from there on, everybody understood toilet is a serious business. We cannot uh, uh, neglect it. And anyway, it's safe now to talk about it. So as you know, the media has so many things that uh, you have to compete for attention, uh, like climate change is very, very big. And then you have the recent COVID. Then of course, soon you will have the World Cup. And then even uh, Kim Kardashian, what she eat for lunch today is also uh, taking a lot of attention. And, and Elon Musk, so where does toilet stands in the in the uh, crowded media space, we managed to carve out every year about 3 billion outreach for uh, World Toilet Day. And all over the world, 193 countries are observing this. This year, World Toilet Summit will be in Nigeria. Tonight, I'm flying to Abuja from Singapore. And the president uh, will open it with the Deputy uh, Secretary General of the UN, Ms. Amina Mohammed, and three other ministers. So it is a very highly legitimate now. High-ranking people like Prime Minister Modi, President of Nigeria, uh, President Xi Jinping is also a toilet champion. And in Brazil, three years ago, we also uh, have World Toilet Summit in Sao Paulo on World Toilet Day. And ever since that day, they have changed the law to allow foreign investment into their sewage treatment plant. And to date, they attracted 10 billion US dollar to their government-owned sewage treatment plant, which is very good because 50% of the shit in Brazil was not treated. And now it starts to get investment to be treated. Then the river will be clean. The beach will be good for tourists. The people will not be sick. And the uh, uh, nutrients can be recycled into fertilizer. So having toilet, having hygiene, hand washing, these are all very, very important. So that is uh, what we do. Yeah. 
Thanks, uh, Jack, for this uh, evolution in history. I just wanted to, since this is an informal conversation with you, I just wanted to ask you, you know, from 2001 onwards, what was the, how, how would you, how did you, how were you able to engage with so many international watch organizations, being a very small organization yourself as WTO, and you said humor was part of your, you know, outreach. And I do remember people used to say, well, this is a good guy who has, you know, put brought him in a world toilet organization with the same acronym and you would, I think, even go to Davos and other places. So, but how did you as an individual had this outreach and, you know, do you also attribute it to some support you got from some organization to highlight this whole agenda at the international level? Or is it Jackson alone who, who is the face of uh, a World Toilet Day? So the World Toilet Organization is, um, we are very small. We, we employ uh, one full-time staff and two part-time staff, but we have hundreds of volunteers all over the world. Whenever we need something, somebody is going to come to help. Uh, if we need the IT help or we need photography, for example, the background picture is uh, done by volunteers. We did our 20th anniversary compilation of our body of work, which is very impressive. You can go to our website and download the book. It's all done by volunteers. And of course, the media is our biggest supporter. So fundamentally, we are not the same as implementation NGO. We don't fundraise. Sometimes people call us to give us money, but we do not actively solicit money because we uh, realize that fundraising costs money. So <laughs> fundraising can be a loss-making business if your fundraiser is not good. You know, So we, we don't employ fundraiser in a, a professional sense, but if we have uh, people calling us up to give us money. Of course, we support, but we use a lot of volunteers. So anybody listening in can participate. And what we did was we created a movement. So a movement is not having a leader. The movement is triggered by a center and then eventually is triggered by many, many centers. So the early adopter of the World Toilet Day was UNICEF and Water Aid. They went very early because it's exactly aligned with them. And we don't even have to say, you do this, I do that. We just all go and do. And it's not really necessary uh, to say who claims the credit because our work is mission focused. So we are driven by the results that people get toilet. So whoever does it is good. So there's no such a thing as a competitor. And put aside our egos, uh, we are all together to solve this problem because humanity needs to have toilets, to have dignity, to have safety, to have health. So what happened is that Later on, people like President Clinton came and uh, do a fundraiser for us, which we raised some money. Uh, this uh, Salman Khan also did the fundraiser for us on live on national television in India. Uh, we have Akshay Kumar on our World Toilet Summit in Maharashtra in, in Mumbai at the Touch Lands End. We have uh, Vidya Balan, Amitabh Bachchan, um, Ranbir Singh, uh, Kauki Kochin. So, so it's, it's a lot of people because they realize that this is important and they, it touched their heart and they come out and, and we pay no body, right? Then Hapi, Rakit Ben Kaiser, Unilever, they all come forward and then uh, Lixil, the sanitary wear people. So it's not a form of solicitation, but they, they just start to call up. So now when I travel uh, long distance, all Nippon Airway is our um, airline partner. So I can fly for free. And then uh, recently, this uh, 
uh, CityLink, Indonesia budget airline also uh, become our uh, airline partner. And so people call up and we, of course, say yes. And we keep on going like that. So I think that the support was uh, tremendous. And it is not a, a one-man uh, effort. It is an entire movement. But we are very glad that we could keep it alive because if we stop to exist, if we close down or go bankrupt, then uh, maybe the other people will not speak about sanitation the same way we do calling a spade a spade, being very funny, humorous, and, and, and keep it uh, highly alive because the professor, they use such a language like fecal sludge management. So when the news journalists listen to fecal sludge management, they don't, how, they don't know how to write a story out of it. They just say treatment for the shit, you know. But the professor cannot say that because they are scientists, they have academic language. So I think that to do this job, you have to be a little bit... Uh, let's say irreverent right and then uh, i i i've been a, a person not in the development sector i'm a outsider businessman coming in uh, not not having a a paid job i, I can say what i want and it become very effective now you are also a professor and doctor yourself, so I'm sure you, you would call yourself a professor of practice and not an academic professor. So that's great to hear from you, Jack, that you see this as a movement and not as a leadership-based individual movement, but where you've been able to bring so many people and celebrities and governments along with you. I just have two questions in a, as a follow-up. One is that in 2010, UN declared the right to water sanitation. And the World Toilet Day was designated in 2013. So how do you see, firstly, this, uh, you know, this issue of 2010 as a right to water and sanitation, and then 2013 as a World Toilet Day? Do you see any congruence or you know, divergence in these two aims at the international level? And my second would be question as a follow up would be, you know, how, how the next steps so, or, you know, how we come to that then. But first, this 2010 and 2013. Mm. So the UN is a place that gives legitimacy. Yeah. It has got convening power, it's a good place for meeting. But I don't think that the UN is very good at implementation. So what you do is you go to the UN, you get the legitimacy, which gives you the um, official aura around like a, like a halo on your head. And then you have to work hard on it. And with a lot of people working together, that combination helped very much. I think that the, you can go to World Water, Week in Stockholm, you can go to a World Water Forum. These are very huge meetings. But the important thing is that they don't talk about sanitation. You go to 22,000 people meeting and they don't talk about sanitation. So this is something so neglected that we have to keep it alive. And I hope everybody in this seminar can start to put some effort yourself and talk about it because you will also become a champion for this. Yeah. So uh, if you, if we see your, uh, uh, the UN 2010 mandate says it's a right. Whereas I've heard you speak several times that for you having 
an experience of a safe, secure, functional toilet is seen as a basic necessity. But you say often refrain from positioning it as a right and a responsibility. Perhaps, as you said, because you work with governments, so you see it as a collaborative movement rather than, you know, many NGOs take that role or position of how to ensure the rights and entitlements, whereas in your discourse, it's about humor, it's about involvement, it's about raising the pitch. So uh, in that sense, I was asking about the 2010 declaration. Is it more or less just a norm in name that we have secured it as a right, but is it still... Uh, declaring it as a right is very important. And uh, absolutely support this, not, not to avoid it. The question is, after it is declared, how do you incentivize the politician to actually act on it, right? The politician has to choose agenda which can benefit them. What the politician wants every day in the top of their head is how to win votes, popularity, and stay in power. Or if they are not in power, to win power. So you have to always align what is the agenda with what is the incentive. For example, if you go and scold the politician and say, you are no good. You didn't do this, you didn't do that, you're no good. He's not going to listen, he shut his ear. So you have to say, this is a good agenda, would you like to champion it? And then he will say, sounds like I can do this, uh, another one will say, now nah, I've got a lot of other things I represent, other agenda. So you find those who can be aligned. And I think that when you give the moral position of it, it is, let's say, the start of a good approach. But it doesn't mean that they will get excited, you know. So this is... When you want to solve problem, it's called mutual exploitation is collaboration. If you want to exploit the politician, the politician also want to exploit your media coverage. And this is a win-win situation. But if you go around moralizing instead of solving and you score people, uh, I think they are not going to listen. Sure. I think that you know because of your business acumen and where you've come from, you know that better than the NGOs do. Uh, my next question was that given India, South Asia, if you see Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, a lot of our countries have made significant pro progress in access to toilets in the last five years. You mentioned India and the open defecation campaign which we had and the culmination in 2019. So this agenda of access to toilets seems to have been achieved to a great extent. Do you still see a relevance of promoting uh, toilets uh, in the years to come? Will it still remain an important agenda globally? Yes, I think it will remain a very important agenda for a very, very long time. So there are a few stages. First is um, in 2001, 2.6 billion people don't have access to proper sanitation. That is 40% of the world population without access. Today, 2 billion don't have access to proper sanitation. And that is 25% uh, of the world population because the world population has grown by another 2 billion. So effectively, that 2.6 billion who don't have have already uh, been replaced by 2 billion new ones. So this continues, right? The other problem is that even if they have toilets, do they have sewage treatment? So more than half of the world shit is not treated. They go discharged into the river. They, they then start to contaminate the pristine river, the, to become polluted. And then all these kinds of diseases are spread. The third thing is that whatever we throw away are actually 
valuable resources which can be recycled into fertilizer, but we didn't have the science to cheaply uh, recycle this. And so because the urbanization, people are living in the city, but the fertilizer is needed far away in the, in the village, in the rural area. So those transportation costs make them like not so viable, but we have to think how to uh, recycle this because soon we will run out of phosphorus if we keep on mining it and phosphorus, potassium, and, and energy that can give nitrogen and PK. Eventually, we will run into a shortage of this chemical fertilizer. Furthermore, even if you are a developed country like New York or London, your public toilet is extremely dirty and also shortage, not enough. People are spending so much money on war and war become a priority because politicians realize that war can win elections because when they promote weapons, they get support for their uh, political uh, campaigns from weapon manufacturer. Whereas if they were to build toilets or improve infrastructure, it might not get those popularity. So nowadays, politics are not very healthy. That's why if you take the, the situation of the United Kingdom, when COVID happened, they cut foreign aid by one billion pounds. And they say, we have no money. There's a COVID, so Britain doesn't have enough money, so they cut one billion pound. But when the Ukraine war happened, they suddenly have one billion pound to donate for weapons. So you can understand priorities are very different in governments these days. And, and why don't sit down on the table and make peace rather than prolong a war while people are not having toilets. So I think that you can see Greta Thunberg scolding everybody, but will they switch off the aircon? Will they uh, stop driving their cars? The answer is no. You have to think how to align their interests with the greater good and figure out the solution. I think the world toilet movement in the last 21 years has actually made a very significant contribution to the world's uh, improvement in sanitation. And recently with COVID, if you think about COVID, it's basically a hygiene problem. People are spreading it to one another. And that is suddenly people become very careful, they wash their hands, they put on masks, they have social distancing. Now you see COVID is going away and what do they do? They don't wash their hands again. Do you know hand washing itself can solve about 50% of all developing countries, uh, food contamination and, and diseases. Uh, but this is the kind of problem that we need behavioral change. We need people to constantly be reminded. They were just came out of a life and death crisis that lasted two over years called COVID. And then they forgot about their hygiene habit. So constant reminder, we need to carry on our work. And in the future, for toilet in the future, it can prevent diseases because toilet diagnostic, you urinate, the toilet can take your urine sample. You defecate, you can take your stool sample and he can read your health. So you can be something like your Fitbit telling you how healthy you are in a certain way, heartbeat and all that, heart pressure, but the toilet become a data center. And if preventive, and predictive health can replace curative health, then it becomes very cheap to be healthy as a whole country because the doctor is not a health practitioner. He's going to cure you. He's a 
sick care person, not a healthcare person. He wait till you get sick before he get into action. Whereas sanitation workers, we prevent people from getting sick. So prevention is cheaper than cure, it's also better than cure. And we should focus on the technology in the toilet so that we can at least remove half of all hospital and clinics needed. Sure. So, so what you are saying, Jack, is that um, toilets will always remain a priority because that's the first point of handling the feces. And then comes this issue of treatment and safe disposal or reuse in agriculture and other factors. Also, the fact that the world is very unequal. So we have also an increasing issue or a challenge of the poor not having access to good quality toilets or not having access to water for using the toilets or not even having access to public toilets, which you earlier mentioned it remains a big issue, or not having access to school toilets, especially in remote areas or rural areas. So to that extent, yes, the toilet should be a focus. Uh, but the way WTO and you yourself have promoted toilets as as a issue which doesn't get recognition through humor, through your events at the international level, through you know the the urgent run and other promotional activities, don't you think that promoting the second level of challenges of treatment, reuse, uh, uh, nine nutrient cycle, which is equally important, would require another challenge of communication and outreach. Because again, the whole thing is presented, as you were saying, like fecal sludge management, how to manage the fecal sludge. But uh, from is it also a priority of your work now to get into the next level of nutrient cycle and reuse and you know, the whole issue of uh, what we normally call a sanitation service chain now, from the containment to the rest. So there, how does the, how do you see as a challenge as at the international level? Okay, so um, we do that all the time uh, because if you don't think about the whole cycle, you still don't solve the whole problem. Uh, the term now we use is called safely managed sanitation so it means all the way from uh, the superstructure to the underground structure for the treatment and all the different type of treatment according to the infrastructure if there's no sewer pipe you have to have a standalone toilet and a lot of technology are already invented and and company like elixir is actually promoting very low cost toilet even um that they can afford it, right? So um, no missing of this point. What we say when we uh, provoke people to think toilet is because the toilet is the most clearest image for them. And then from that conversation, we talk about the entire treatment. Depend on who, right? If you are talking to policy maker, then this kind of, uh, like we changed the uh, law in Brazil by lobbying in the Senate in Brasilia to start a bill and then they launch it at World Toilet Summit. So seven months later after World Toilet Summit 2019, in June, uh, 2020, the law was passed. And from that day till now, 10 billion US dollars have been invested. So that is clearly uh, the work that we are doing together with the Brazilian government, together with Trata Brazil, who is the uh, NGO lobbying for it. And I'm going back again because now Bolsonaro is gone, Lula is back. We have got a whole bunch of new politicians that we need to educate again. So this work is continuous, you know. And on top of that, sanitation is linking to other uh, related agenda like education. If you don't have a toilet, the woman cannot 
change sanitary napkin because there's no privacy. They drop out from school during their menstrual period. And after a while, they couldn't catch up. They drop off altogether. So there is a lot of related to tourism in China, for example. You'll be so surprised that Chinese public toilet were very, very poor condition. When I go for visiting uh, the Hakka, uh, famous uh, villages, the toilet was such that before you reach the toilet, you already see all the poop outside the toilet because the inside is unbearable. And President Xi Jinping became a proponent of China toilet revolution. But we started in 2004 when they were preparing for the Olympics and they need the toilet to be good. Otherwise, Olympic will fail. They want the Olympic to be like the best Olympic ever in the history, right? So the Olympics succeeded in 2008 because the toilet didn't create the bad publicity and it was good. So after that, all the tourism bureau in entire China, provinces, city level, national level, they all promote toilet. Today, if you go to a third tier, fourth tier, fifth tier city, the toilet is clean, at least for the tourism toilet. It's all clean. And it's very shocking that such a big country can change the culture so fast, right? So fast means like, you know, 12 years, right? But it's still a very big country. And, and recently we go out there to build some sample, 15, 15 uh, rural school toilet. We call it the World Toilet Organization Rainbow School Toilet Program. And after we have done that, we train the student to clean it themselves because if we ask other people to clean, the student will not behave. So we ask the student to clean, suddenly they care for their toilet. And we gave that model to the Ministry of Education in China and they are going to implement it in 215,000 schools. Can you imagine 215,000 schools? That number like, shocks me because I, I come from a country with 5.6 million people. Singapore has only 400 schools. So the proportion of impact that we can create by leveraging other people to act and incentivizing them is amazing. Sure. So just to, I mean, there are no questions in terms of in this conversation. You explained in the detail the kind of work which you have done and which you still continue to do. Um, I would only, uh, I would like to, you know, invite some of our participants if they have any questions and uh, if any of the participants here in this webinar, if you have any question, kindly raise your hand and then we will ask you to speak. Also, if there is any question you want to pose in the Q&A, you are most welcome to do that and Jack would be answering your questions. Uh, just uh, there is uh, just one point, last point, Jack, which I had on my list was uh, how do you see this challenge between urban and rural sanitation? So, does do you see it as a different approach, or do you see the same approach as you have been following so far? It's different because the. Uh strata of wealth is different. The rural people uh, needs, uh, they don't have in infrastructure, pipe, uh, sewerage system. So you need the on-site treatment, you need small scale uh, sewerage treatment. And they are also a bit resistant to change the habit because going to the toilet with a bunch of friends squatting together to shit. It's a social event. And they found nothing wrong. If we have been doing this since our great-grandfather time, so why change, right? So I think there are a lot of religious leaders that can help. There's a lot of village chief that can help. 
And it takes time, but it will surely happen because people watch television, they see other people having toilet. So they also want to keep up with the Jonas. So sometimes when you want to solve problem, you think of it as a moral issue, it's not so easy to solve. But if you generate the jealousy, the one-upmanship, the comparison, then suddenly it becomes a trigger because the poor do have some money. You go to the rural area, you see they buy a lot of snacks. They buy a lot of toddy. Um, they also buy lottery. So if And then they have a lot of money for festivals. All kinds of festivals. They're spending a lot of money and a lot of God's birthday. So of course they can still do that, but maybe they spend a little bit less. Once they want to have the toilet, they can prioritize. They might even rear some chicken uh, to sell and make extra income just to build a toilet. So I think there are so many ways. There are also microfinance who can help. So it takes everybody, but first you have to drive the demand. And then the technology, there's a, a comment here that says uh, biochar is a good technology. Yes, it is one of them. And so in each type of situation, you use the type of technology that is suitable, right? So where someone can be uh, motivated to use biochar, that is also a good solution. It, it comes from just having a, a, dig a hole and plant a banana tree next to it to use the banana to drink the nutrients from the feces and the urine to all the way a Japanese automated toilet that uh, spray water and warm you and all that. So, so many uh, options are available, but they are all customized to culture, religion, uh, wealth strata, and the location you are staying in. Even underwater, groundwater, uh, if it's very deep or it's very high water table, all this uh, consideration of hydrology is very, very critical as well. Yeah. So a lot of our areas in India have flood, flood plains and you know you can't have very traditional uh, toilets there. But at the same time, if you build other kind of toilets like EcoSan, then there is an issue of they're costly and they have to be managed and operated. But just one last question I had was on the approach. Like you were saying, any approach which promotes toilet is fine with you. And any technology which is relevant can be, uh, should be adopted. But what, what is your opinion about this community-led total sanitation? That was an approach which was, you know, followed a lot in promoted a lot in India and some other countries. But did you have a chance to comment on it or, you know, uh, critique it in any way? I think uh, CLTS has great success. It all depends on the person who is able to trigger it. So if you have very good natural leaders, if you have um, very uh, charismatic leaders, uh, it can be very successful, very persuasive. Uh, where you don't have it, it can fail. And after you promoted the CLTS, and people start to really feel that the toilet is important, then you have to follow up with the supply of the toilet. And if you don't follow up, eventually the pits get full or it's collapsed and there is no next upgrading then it might relapse back into open defecation again. Uh, uh, most of the time, people who enjoy using a toilet doesn't want to go back to open defecation again. However, you have to make sure that after the initial success of one year, two years, that it is sustainable. And if it's sustained over three, four years, uh, you, you are quite sure that it will never relapse. So uh, the quality of the delivery is important, but CLTS has done great work 
uh, it has gone to so many countries in Africa, in in India, in Bangladesh, everywhere. So uh, my my friend Kamal Ka started this, and and he's also one of the World Dialogue Organization Hall of Fame Award winner. This year, uh, we are also awarding to uh, ministers and leaders in Africa. So, yeah, we, we, we have to keep this agenda alive. And I hope everybody here can uh, join us. And if anybody wants to contact me, uh, just uh, feel free. Yeah, uh, there's one question here on, on Nepal. Yes. Yeah, yeah I... I, I think that uh, I have been also, and I think this is one country that uh, we need to work with the local leaders uh, very much. I'll tell you something, a lot of the time, pilot program last three years, and NGO always like to raise money for pilot program, but there's no follow up after fund runs out. We need leaders who believe that this problem needs to be solved rather than those NGO who are just a fundraising hunter, you know? And if today the guy is doing sanitation and tomorrow there is a RFP for climate change, then he will switch to climate change because there's money there. Those kind of NGO actually not very genuine. They are basically fundraising to pay salary rather than to solve problems. And they do whatever the donor want them to do. So it's more important that there are leaders who are really determined and want to solve the sanitation crisis. So the NGO sector, the development sector is quite wasteful, you know. Sometimes overheads are like 60%, 70% per dollar. So that's why we, we try our best not to keep a lot of overheads and we do the part that we do best and let other people do the part that they can do and we align with everyone. Thanks, Jack. Uh, any last words you have? Because uh, that's all from our side and we are very grateful that we could have you here and on your tight schedule of lying out tonight, you gave us this opportunity to discuss some of these issues at this forum. Uh, so we're very grateful. I, I think there's one more question somebody has posted now. Um, okay, let's just uh, follow up agreement with you. So any last point, Jack, which you have to share, then we will call it a day. I, I, uh, I don't know how to type. Maybe I'll just uh, type my uh, email address here. So anybody who, who needs, uh, oh, I don't know. How do I type? Maybe I can just say, uh, you can all contact me at jacksim, as I am, jacksim at worldtoilet.org. And uh, if you have any more questions, suggestions, problems, uh, let's discuss. We are not a, we are not a funder, but uh, we can connect you to answers. And if you are genuine, we can work together in a lot of, of solutions. We are also uh, fundraising to create a symphony in P minor. So we are getting the Singapore Symphony Orchestra to play a piece of music for toilets, right? So there is so there is so many things that you can do. So maybe uh uh to to end uh if, if there's nothing, there is a, a piece of music by uh, Sekoji. I'll just uh, put it here and then you can play the song and uh, you can you can close this meeting with this song. I, I will I will type it here. Yeah. So some stocks are down 30 to 60 percent this year or even more. And if you're holding on to this no. So I'll put it here and you can play play this play this song. Can you do that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just a minute. Oh. So this is a rap song by, by uh, an Indonesian rap singer. Oh.
very very good and you can uh, play this song everywhere uh, just as a just as a spreading the the message yeah are you able to share screen and play this doing that just just a moment good good song so i'll say goodbye here and uh, you listen to the song and enjoy yourself thank you jack thanks for saying Yeah, yeah, yeah. Told my homies, yo, we gon' make a hit, huh? We gon' make a hit while we're talking shit, hey. Take a sip, huh? Shit, this it is lit, ah. Bit your monkey gate, guy, I like it, you beat it. Woo! Told my homies, yo, we gon' make a hit, huh? We gon' make a hit while we're talking shit, hey. Take a sip, huh? Shit, this it is lit, yeah. Bit your monkey gate, guy, I like it, you beat it, yeah. Talk about it, talk, talk about it, yeah. Talk about it, talk, talk about it, yeah. Talk about it, talk, talk about it, yeah. It's gonna be the only song you hear me talk about shit. Like literally, no cap. I'm about to talk about shit, kaka and all that. Life improvements with proper sanitation, then you got this. Call it a movement, power movement, I obvious. All jokes aside, man, like we all do it. Kadang gamba, kadang keras, kadang sulit. And on some other days, we can't seem to quit. Imagine those without a proper toilet, love your roommate. Uh, told my homies, yo, we gonna make a hit, huh? We gon' make a hit while we're talking shit, hey. Take a sip, ha, <laughs> shit, this it is lit, ah. Bit your monkey gate, guy, I like it, you beat it, woo. Told my homies, yo, we gon' make a hit, ah. We gon' make a hit while we're talking shit, hey. Take a sip, ha, <laughs> shit, this it is lit, ah. Bit your monkey gate, guy, I like it, you beat it, yeah. Talk about it, talk, talk about it, yeah. Talk about it, talk, talk about it, yeah. Talk about it, talk, talk about it, yeah. It's gonna be the only song you hear me talk about, shit. yeah. Man, without a toilet, Muji can select the hey. About two billion people lives like that anyway. They squat, do the business, that's it, man. La mer, tawa goto, excrement. Shit goes down in the water, man. People use that. That means disease about to happen, man. That's too bad. I'm not trying to disgust nobody, but y'all must know. Cause in life, when you got to go, you got to go. Mmm. Told my homies, yo, we gon' make a hit, huh? We gon' make a hit while we're talking shit, hey. Take a sip, ha, <laughs> shit, this it is lit, da. Bit your monkey kid, guy, I like it, you beat it, woo. Told my homies, yo, we gon' make a hit, ha. Uh. We gon' make a hit while we're talking shit, hey. Take a sip, ha, <laughs> shit, this it is lit, da. Bit your monkey kid, guy, I like it, you beat it, yeah. Talk about it, talk, talk about it, yeah. Talk about it, talk, talk about it, yeah. Talk about it, talk, talk about it, yeah. This gon' be the only song you hear me talk about, shit. Thank you, thank you, everyone, and happy World Toilet Day. Thank you, Jack, for joining. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Bye.